indeed, and good evening to you all. Uh, can I say it's an enormous pleasure for me this evening to introduce our guest speaker, Julian uh, from Chelmsford. Can I say at the outset that Julian uh, has toured more bars than a rugby team? And I say that for this reason. Um, Julian was called uh, initially to the bar of England and Wales at Lincoln's Inn in 1993. He was then called to the Scots Bar in 1999 and then to the Bar of Ireland in 2018. Uh, he took silk in 2006 in England and Wales and in Scotland in 2010. In addition to his uh, work as a Queen's Council, he's also a judge. He is a, a judge of the first tier and deputy judge of the upper tier tax tribunal. Uh, he has a, a most impressive background. He's a senior fellow at the International Tax Centre in Leiden, uh, just between uh, Amsterdam and The Hague in the Netherlands. And he's speaking to us this evening in his capacity as a by fellow of Peterhouse College at Cambridge uh, University. He is an expert in uh, matters of taxation, uh, corporate work generally, and in particular. European uh, taxation issues. He's a member of the Revenue Bar Association, the Chancery Bar Association, the Bar European Group, the Value Added Tax Practitioners Group, and the London Common Law and Monetary Bar Association. Uh, for those of you who wish to purchase something for the second or friends on a pre order basis, if it is available, I can tell you that Julian's talk tonight uh, is based on on a book on Brexit that is to be published by Bloomsbury Press and also a chapter in Wade and Forsyth's administrative law. Oh, sorry, Judge uh, Rayner. I think yes. you're, just, you're just, your audio is just breaking up a little bit. Maybe if you move a little closer. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Faye. I was talking about chapters that Julian has uh, written for forthcoming publication. The second one is Wade and Forsyth's administrative law and that's to be published by the uh, OUP. So uh, Julian will be speaking tonight broadly about uh, the landscape that will exist uh, after we have uh, effectively left the European Union. This, is, this I think is a really important topic, uh, even in uh, some brief questioning of Julian before we started tonight, it's quite apparent the importance that this subject has for us all. And I for one have certain I think misconceptions about what may be the position and I think this is going to be a most illuminating talk. Julian can I please hand over to you for returning to you for EU post Brexit. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope my um, my audio is is good and everybody can hear me. Um, and uh, let me get straight to the business end of, uh, of this talk and retained EU law. So uh, Judge Rayner's right. What this talk is to do with is uh, to answer the question, how does EU law apply after 31st December 2020? Uh, because up till 31st December, uh, yes, the UK left the EU in January 2020, but we've had this implementation period where EU applies in full form right up until 31st December 2020. What happens after that? And what the UK is trying to do, and this is, this is what my talk's about, it's trying to freeze EU law. It's trying to say, look, EU law, in the way that it has applied in the UK from between 1972 right up to December 2020, we're going to freeze it. And that EU law will continue to apply indefinitely. And Judge Rayner's right. It is important. It's important for a number of reasons. One, what that means is that EU law 
will continue to be an area of substantive law that we have to know about because it will, it's, it's going to be part of UK law. If you don't know what it is, there's a, there's a problem. Um, second, that there, there are many, many problems in the way that the, the, um, uh, the legislation has gone about this and I'll be talking about them. These problems are, are problems, whether you are an academic, whether you're a judge, whether you're counsel, or whether, uh, and there's a lot of you here uh, who are students, whether you're a pupil. Because when you are researching uh, a point of law and EU law, retained EU law is relevant. If you don't know where to look, there's going to be a major hole in your research in your and again, that's going to be a problem. Now, let, let's let's start. Sources of EU law. It's all very well talking about law. What is it? Answer: EU law comes from one, the two treaties, the Treaty of European Union and the Treaty of the Function of the uh, of the European Union. Fine, we all know that. It, uh, those treaties can have direct effect or regulations or directives or importantly, and it's a point I'm going to come back to, EU general principles. So these are substantive general principles of EU law that apply as substantive law, uh, but are not located in, they, they don't come from specific words in the treaty. They are principles of law which the European Court of Justice has developed. Important examples are a right to equal treatment, abuse of law for those of you who do tax or IP, um, principle of effectiveness, that, that EU rights have got to be made um, uh, not excessively difficult to enforce. Uh, equivalence. Lots of them, but these general principles are a separate source of EU law. Remedies, it's all very well talking about EU law. Say somebody breaches your EU rights. Um, what do you do about it? Answer, up till the thir uh, 31st of December, there's a, a hierarchy of remedies. One, sympathetic construction. All courts everywhere are mandated to try and construe domestic legislation to be EU compliant if they can. And the English courts, and here I do mean English in, in, in the sense that the, the, the case law is not as strong in Scotland. The English courts have developed a notion of sympathetic construction, which is very, very, very strong. Some would say it's not even, it's not even construction at all. It goes way beyond construction. But there it is, that's remedy number one courts mandated to try and construe their legislation in a very strong sense to be EU compliant, failing which, so you can't do that. Say the legislation is so clear, you can't construe it to be EU compliant. Failing which, disapplication. That offending legislation is disapplied. You may not want it disapplied. It may be a benefit that you want extended to you. What next then? Damages what's called non-contractual breach, but Frankovich damages. It, it's where a member state, because it's behaving in a non-EU compliant way, because its legislation is non-EU compliant, so long as that breach is sufficiently serious, you can get damages. Failing which restitution. If, and this is most relevant of all in my world in tax, but it's relevant in other worlds too, in other areas of law, if you have paid money to someone and that someone has got that money, but in a non-EU compliant fashion. So you've paid tax. You shouldn't have paid that tax because that tax charge is non-EU compliant. Your remedy isn't damages, your remedy is restitution. You get that money back. So I've said, well, so far so interesting. Um, the purpose of retained EU law, and you'll find this in the EU Withdrawal Act um, 2018. And 
this act, the EU Withdrawal Act, is quite separate. The issues I'm going to be talking about are separate to the rights that EU citizens have got under the Withdrawal Agreement, the 2018 Act and another Act, the EU Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020, brings into UK law the Withdrawal Agreement, which gives uh, as long as the UK sticks to um, uh, what it said it would do, it gives EU citizens certain rights in the UK even after we've left. That's a different conversation. We're not talking about that. My talk is also distinct from not to do with the controversial internal market bill, which is to do with um, if the UK doesn't like certain features of the withdrawal agreement it'll just rip it up particularly to do with the northern Ireland protocol but that's again a different conversation i am talking about the 2018 act the eu withdrawal act 2018 how does it apply eu law after we've left that's the, the, the burden of this talk and like i say it tries to freeze eu law as at 11 o'clock on the 31st of december 2020 and that's actually a project that to, uh, I don't think has ever been done before. No other jurisdiction I know has tried to freeze an area of law to say it stops here. It's still law, but it stops here. Now, after uh, December, no more references to the ECJ or the CJEU, as it's called um, now. Um, the fundamental right of uh, both uh, natural persons, individuals, and companies to establish themselves and to provide services throughout the EU, that's gone. So whatever e retained EU law is, that right of companies to establish themselves wherever they like in the EU, of individuals to set up um, firms or employees, to take jobs wherever they like in the EU, that's gone. Important point number one, the right of establishment and services was removed by regulation. It was removed under 2019 regulations, but the enabling provision was section eight of the 2018 Act. And why am I telling you this? Why is that interesting? Answer, section eight of the 2018 Act what that says is, um, if EU law, which would include retained EU law, is somehow deficient after the UK is left, if the way that EU law is working after the UK has left the EU is deficient, it doesn't fit very well. Ministers are in tight, fit very well with what? Fit very well with other UK law, pre or post the UK leaving ministers are entitled to enact regulations now what's depending how um, emotive you feel surprising stroke alarming uh, is that that's the enabling provision under which uk ministers have enacted the 2019 regs to say fundamental rights of establishment and services have gone and um, it is at least a question of public law as to whether Section 8 permits those, those regs, which are so important, so fundamental, uh, to be enacted under a provision that was really to do with curing deficiencies. I said, um, one of the remedies, if somebody's breached your EU rights, is damages. Uh, sympathetic construction failing, which disapplication failing, which damages. That's gone after we've left. After we've left, judgments of the Court of Justice, judgments of the CJEU, are described in the explanatory notes as um, uh, persuasive only. And again, I'm going to have to come back to Court of Justice uh, decisions. That's a, that's a slight misconception. Uh, the Court of Justice, its job in this context was 
only ever, even when the UK was a member state, to tell us what EU law was. So in a national court, uh, needed to know what EU law was in order to resolve a national dispute, it asked the Court of Justice for a, on a, what was called a preliminary reference, what, what, what is the EU law? It was never the job of the Court of Justice uh, to decide a national, uh, a, 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 a national case. And there are actually several instances where the guidance of the Court of Justice as to how they thought the national dispute should be resolved um, was ignored. The Supreme Court in a case called LM UK, a VAT case, um, as it happens, uh, the Court of Justice thought the answer should be X. The Supreme Court said, very interesting, thanks for telling us what EU law is, we think the answer is Y. However, what's curious about this notion that the ECJ, the CJEU, is persuasive only after we've left is this. National courts are entitled to refer cases right up to 31st December. So uh, I, I, I had to, um, in my capacity as a tribunal judge, uh, I was he hearing a case all to do with, um, it was customs duties uh, uh, on whether something uh, was or wasn't a medicine. Um, if I wanted to, uh, I, I would refer it. The curiosity then is that when the answer comes back from the Court of Justice, I can ignore it. Uh, that's a curiosity. Uh, you could have a state aid case, a case in competition law, decided by the general court, which is an, a, a component part of the Court of Justice. There's an appeal from the general court to the Court of Justice. If the general court, in a very important case, like, for example, Apple, um, on state aid, thinks the law is X, there's no state aid, but on appeal, it turns out after we've left the, uh, the Court of Justice says the law is Y, we are stuck with the general court decision, the pre 31st December decision. So it's a, it's a very curious world we're entering indeed. Now, there are what's called grandfathering provisions. If a case has begun in, the, in a UK court, a UK tribunal or a UK court, before IP completion day, before 31st December 2020, um, for example, Frankovich damages are available. And there are certain other things which are available. But the case has got, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to those, but the case has got to be begun. But the 2018 Act, and this is all tucked away in a schedule, Schedule 8, doesn't tell us what does it mean to be a case to be begun. Not helpful. Uh, does it mean you've got to have lodged grounds of appeal? Does it mean you've got to have written a, a, a pre-action um, letter? We're not told. And this is something judges will have to grapple with. What does it mean if a party wants to claim Frankovich damages in a case begun before the 31st of December? What, is, what does it need to show? I think myself, it means that the the court process has to have been begun. The court has to be engaged, not pre-litigation correspondence, the court process has to be engaged. Now, what about retained EU law? What is it? What is, what is it that EU law is that we are going to keep after we've left? One point that you need to bear in mind, and this is for all of you, wherever you are in the spectrum of, of practice, it's instructive that the 2018 Act, which tells us that retained EU law stays as part of our law, doesn't tell us what EU law is. It, it tells us categories, which I'm going to come to, but it doesn't tell us, doesn't define um, what the sources of EU law is. So if you don't know what EU law is, you've got a problem. As I'll show you, but in the sense of telling you, it tells us categories of EU law which are going to stay in our law, but then you've got to go off and study what EU law is to understand what is being kept. I'll tell you what I mean. Starting with number one, this is in section two of the 2018 Act, EU-derived legis uh, legislation, EU-derived domestic UK legislation. That means 
UK domestic legislation, primary acts or secondary legislation, which were enacted for the purpose of EU law, section two of the 1972 Act. So what does that mean? It certainly means statutory instruments that were enacted uh, that um, to, to, to make sure that the UK complied with EU law. It also includes primary acts, the VAT Act, for instance. VAT's an EU tax. The VAT Act was clearly enacted for the purpose of the UK's EU obligations. So that is comprised in the first category of EU law, EU derived domestic legislation. But that means every time you look at any legislation, primary or secondary, and it may not say on the face of the act, you need to check whether that primary or secondary legislation was enacted for the purpose of securing UK compliance with EU law. Because if it is, then it's retained EU law. And that matters. And I'm going to tell you why it matters. Category two. Category two is, and this is in section three of the 2018 Act, direct EU legislation. What does that mean? It means regulations and decisions of um, the Commission or regulations, EU regulations. Word of warning. And this is a warning for all of us. You'd think, well, that means all regulations everywhere uh, that, the, that has ever been issued by the EU, whether by the Commission or by the Council. It may not, because there may be specific provisions in other statutes, and your research techniques have got to be 100% um, that exclude particular regulations from section three. In other words, they don't count as retained EU law. In my world, in the tax world, a very important regulation, the VAT implementing regulation, is expressly excluded from being retained EU law uh, by section 42 of a completely different act, the Taxation um, Cross-Border Trade Act 2018. You'd never know, you have to look. It's either, and it's either it's either out there, this provision that excludes a particular regulation from being retained EU law or it isn't. You're not going to be able to guess. You're not going to be able to um, uh, intuit your way to knowing. Category three, this is section four of the 2018 Act. Other recognized and available EU rights. What are they? Well, they would be rights that we would have had by direct application of either the treaties or directives. Um, and, but this is heavily qualified, general principles. I'm going to come back to that. Heavily qualified, but certainly directly effective treaty rights that we would have had before we left, that uh, um, uh, application of directives, they are hoovered up in the third category of recognized and available. Are we told what it means that an EU right is recognized and available? Well, no, we're not. So again, we will eventually need judges in, in decisions, in court decisions, to tell us what that means. I think recognized and available means that that EU right has to have been enforced. Uh, I can see that uh, somebody's complaining that the sound keeps going out. I'll try and stay closer to my, um, uh, to my computer. The, um, that EU right has to have been enforced by a court of record. So a first year tribunal, no. A court of record, upper tribunal, and above, yes. That's what I think. Important point, Charter of Fundamental Rights. Now this was, um, of course, a specific category of rights directly effective as a matter of EU law before we left absolutely true after we've left that's gone that goes um, 
However, there's an extraordinary provision in Section 5 of the uh, 2018 Act, this EU Withdrawal Act, that says you've got to read ECJ cases, CJEU cases, dealing with the Charter of Fundamental Rights as if when they're referred to fundamental rights, that case, that decision referred to um, general principles of EU law. What does that mean? Well, what the drafts person thinks it means is if you've got, you're reading a CJ, an ECJ, a CJEU uh, decision dealing with, for example, a right to dignity, you've got to pretend that whatever the court reads and says the fundamental right of dignity, you've got to pretend that case is actually to do with a general principle, if there is one of a right to dignity. And the trouble is the Charter of Fundamental Rights is not, the one thing it absolutely isn't, is a codification of general principles. So this is a highly, highly problematic uh, provision in the 2018 Act. Now there are more problems. Supremacy, now you all know this is kind of all level EU law. EU law had the twin attributes of supremacy and direct effect. And what we're told is retained EU law retains the feature of supremacy for UK law enacted pre 31st December, but not post 31st December. Um, there is though a problem. Let's say you've got a section two category of retained EU law um, in the VAT Act. That was enacted for the purpose of EU law. It's retained EU law, all right. Trouble is, let's say the VAT Act wasn't compliant with EU law. It wasn't compliant with the principal VAT directive. How does that interact with your section four right of the direct application of the treaty or a general principle, the right to equal treatment or proportionality. Of course, the act doesn't say, I say of course, it's really because I've kind of worked myself up into kind of anti-EU um, uh, withdrawal 2018 act rage, but, but it, it, it doesn't say. My tentative answer, is that the Section 4 right will trump a non-EU compliant Section 2 right. In other words, a UK Act which was purportedly brought in to be EU compliant, but which isn't EU compliant, is subservient to a Section 4 EU right of what would, what would have been before we left uh, the direct application of a directive or the treaties. What about general principles? And like I say, the, these are terrifically important. Abuse of law, non-discrimination. What the Act says is they stay, but unlike the world before we left, they can't find a cause of action. So they are interpretative only. So they only apply if you can find a textual provision in retained EU law in sections uh, two or three or four. And then you can use the general principle of effectiveness or equivalence or abuse of law to interpret that. Now, again, giving you an example from, from my world, the tax world, abuse of law is used by HMRC, not as an interpretive provision, but as a substantive provision. If it's attacking a VAT scheme, which, uh, which it considers abusive, it doesn't go around looking for a text in the VAT Act to say, oh, let's interpret that. It says, abuse of law, that's what applies. Where does this principle that you'll find in Schedule 1 of the 2018 Act, where does this put abuse of law? Um, answer 
I think if uh, it, it is interpretative only, unless, unless you have a decision which has applied abuse of law or any general principle which binds you. So I'll tell you what, I'll, 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 I'll explain what I mean, I'll, I'll let this play out. Let's say I'm sitting as a, an upper tribunal judge. Somebody's on a VAT scheme. HMRC doesn't like it. They say abuse of law. I say, well, it's interpretative only. But if a court that binds me, the Court of Appeal uh, or the Supreme Court, has applied in a pre-December 2020 decision the abuse of law as a substantive principle that binds me. And that is specific in the act. So what it says is, look, when you're trying to apply a general principle, it's an, it, it can't find a cause of action unless a higher court has decided and that binds you. You think, well, all right, I've got there. All I need to check is whether a higher court than me has applied a general principle and then I'm good. Except it gets madder. It gets madder. How? It gets madder because section six, five capital A to five capital C, for those of you who um, want to chase this up, this was introduced um, to, as it were, deliver a UK badge on retained EU law. It says, look, once the EU has uh, uh, and the UK are separate legal regimes, we want to make this visible. And so what this section says, section, uh, section six, five capital A to five capital C, what this says is the following courts, and this is done by regulation, can depart from uh, CJEU decisions if they think there is good reason. And that's the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal, the inner house of the Court of Session, which is the, 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 the equivalent in Scotland, the Court Martial and the Land Valuation um, uh, Tribunal. So now we're in a world where if I'm the upper tribunal and I'm trying to decide a case and I say, I need to apply general principle. Oh, the Supreme Court says the abuse of law, that applies, good, I'll follow that. In between deciding a case and writing my judgment, the Supreme Court, but not just the Supreme Court, it may be in the Court of Appeal, says, well, we don't like that. We've chosen to depart. What is um, not clear on the face of the legislation, and this is um, problematic, is how this right, the statutory right of a court to depart, um, the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court in the Inner House, to depart from previous Court of Justice decisions, how does that um, relate to the doctrine of precedent? Because generally speaking, for example, the English Court of Appeal is not entitled to depart from a previous Court of Appeal decision. That's a matter of precedent. We are not told whether if the Court of Appeal in, let's say, 2010 has decided a particular case applying a general principle, the Court of Appeal in 2021 can use this provision to say that doesn't bind us. I think my tentative answer is that the doctrine of precedent, because it's not displaced, will govern and trump uh, Section six, but we have to wait and see. So we're in a place where one source of EU law has been relegated from being substantive to interpretative, but not for courts which are bound by higher courts, but only if the higher court hasn't chosen to depart from previous decisions. Final point, sympathetic construction. And I said, uh, uh, this is a very strong mandate of national courts to 
construe their legislation to be compliant with EU law if they can. Now, um, this comes from two places if you're an EU lawyer. It comes from the doctrine of supremacy, but it also comes from what, uh, the loyalty clause, the, the duty of sincere cooperation in the TEU. So the, 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 the duty of courts to construe national legislation sympathetically comes from two sources. The reason I'm making a meal of this is because if you read the explanatory notes, it says, oh no, it only comes from one source, supremacy. Um, that's just wrong. Why is that important? It's important because let's say we have a case in Frontier Tribunal, the Upper Tribunal, Court of Appeal, Supreme Court, where you are applying retained EU law, you're applying a treaty right or a directive right. Uh, and you're saying, for example, it is it trumps, it's supreme over uh, uh, an inconsistent UK Act that was enacted pre-December 2020. And you say, oh, there's a duty on the part of you, the Supreme Court, or indeed any court, to construe this sympathetically. Is there? Um, I don't think there is. I'll tell you why that I, I don't think there is. Um, as I say, first of all, the duty of sympathetic construction comes from two places, supremacy and the loyalty clause. The loyalty clause is in the TEU, and the UK left the EU in January 2020. So the loyalty clause hasn't applied in the UK since 2020. The implementation period extended the application of EU law. That's a different point. Second. And this is what I think judges will be asking. You want me to construe this, what you say is a UK um, statute enacted pre-December 2020 sympathetically. Sympathetically to what? Because the, when the UK was a, a member a state of the EU, it would be sympathetically to the treaties. That was the duty. That was the whole point of sympathetic construction. Once the UK has left, the regime that applies is the 2018 Act. It's Brexit. Parliament says that the 2018 Act and retained EU law is to be construed in the light of this new Brexit regime. This new regime, which is the 2018 Act. There's no loyalty clause. And there is an analogy here. Um, for those of you who are interested in public law of, uh, and there's no, I'm not making a political point here at all. For um, previous um, uh, UK colonies, when they gained their independence, a lot of them uh, retained legislation that was enacted when they were a colony. And their courts then had to grapple with, how do we construe this legislation that was enacted when we were a colony, but post-independence, it's still here, it's the same legislation. How do we construe it now? Uh, a, a UK Act that was um, enacted to be EU compliant, uh, and, uh, a regulation that was given uh, effect in the UK uh, because of Section 2 of the 72 Act, direct effect of the treaties uh, or uh, a directive that had traction, that had force in UK law, how do we apply these now in the light of this new legislative regime? And it's the, what, uh, there's a principle and it's called the local, of, uh, uh, it's local jurisdiction exception. It's, it's well known to um, public lawyers. And what the technique that many jurisdictions uh, that were colonies that ceased to be colonies, what they, um, what they did was to say, of course, we're looking at the same words that were enacted before um, we became independent. We're construing those same words, it's true, but it's in a new light. 
and that means they may have a new meaning. And there's a case where uh, um, called Carreras, which if you're a tax lawyer, is often um, viewed as just one more boring case on, on the application of what tax lawyers call the Ramsey principle. Not that really that interesting. In, uh, what is interesting, if you're a public lawyer, is that it's often used as an example of Jamaican legislation uh, that was enacted and construed by the Privy Council um, in a manner which recognized that Jamaica, although it's using uh, um, language and a statute that's identical to that in the UK, is a different jurisdiction. It's an independent jurisdiction. It's a different regime. And this local jurisdiction exception, the recognition that all of EU law, which you have to know about, but nevertheless needs to be construed in the light of a new regime, I suspect will be the, the, the mandate, the canon of construction we've all got to use. So that's where we get to. You will all, we will all need to know what is EU law prior to 31st December 2020. We need to know which acts were brought in to comply with uh, EU law may not, may not always be apparent. We need to know what's expressly excluded from being a retained EU law. We need to know whether a court, the Court of Appeal particularly, has decided to depart from its previous decisions on EU law. And we need to grapple with, I think, new techniques of construction. I'll leave it there. I, I hope that's uh, of some help uh, to, to navigate this. Um, Judge Rayner, for whom uh, 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 many thanks for his introduction, um, I have um, written a chapter in a book on, on Brexit, uh, uh, which will be coming out next, um, I think, next February, uh, where uh, I've dealt with all of these um, issues and, 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 and others in great detail uh, and um, given you the references of where to, um, where to find uh, authority for, this, for these propositions I'm giving you. Uh, so you, you'll have somewhere to go. Uh, to um, have a to to get, to get a, a a route map to be able to navigate through these issues. Um, thanks very much. Now, there's questions. I wonder if I could ask Emma just to relay the questions to me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if anybody has more questions, we have one question so far. But if anybody has more, if they would like to put them into the into the Q and A. Um, so I have one question. Uh, after Brexit, in an international dispute, who will the courts refer to in order to establish whether, for example, the court in England has jurisdiction or the court in Germany? Uh, that will just be a function of conflicts of laws. So if you're talking about real property, uh, it'll be lex situs. If you're talking about um, contracts, it'll be lex contractus. Uh, so, um, the, the, the short answer is in, in, in a dispute, it'll be just like a dispute involving the UK and Singapore. Uh, and and party, parties will have the, the ability to choose a jurisdiction. Uh, so uh, they'll have choice of jurisdiction clauses. Um, and the, my answer though is, 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 is not dealing with rights of um, EU citizens uh, under the withdrawal agreement, because there the Court of Justice has retained jurisdiction, okay. unless the UK decides to rip that out. That's a different conversation. Okay, uh, we have another question. Uh, do you think Brexit will signal a retreat from proportionality review? As a matter of public law, no. Uh, 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 the, um, so, uh, it's been now recognized, uh, uh, proportionality has been recognized uh, as being a distinct source of, uh, again, uh, I think I mean English, uh, English administrative law, um, distinct from uh, proportionality as an EU lawyer. Uh, and, and that's been recognized um, actually by the House of Lords even before the Supreme Court came into being. So that ship has sailed proportionality and the interrogation of uh, 
decisions of public bodies as to whether it goes beyond what's necessary, as to whether it, it, it's trying to achieve um, uh, something within the jurisdiction of that public body, that's here to stay. Okay. Uh, so I have another one. Um, how will the differential interpretation principle apply inter se the UK, UK jurisdictions re retained EU law? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I've understood. Well, I can be bolder than that. I didn't understand that. Um, okay, so, let's so, read it again. Uh, how will the differential interpretation principle apply inter se the UK jurisdictions re retained EU law? Oh, um, the questioner can 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 um, uh, tell me if I'm wrong about this. If if what the questioner means is, if you've got courts in Scotland uh, and then courts again in England uh, or Northern Ireland uh, coming to uh, different views, um, how is that going to be reconciled? The answer is, um, well, you'll have to first of all ask the statutory context in which a Scots court comes to an answer that the law is X. Uh, because then uh, a stat certain statutory regimes, tax is an example, um, employment law is another example, where the jurisdiction is UK-wide. And so we're told that a decision of a Scots court is supposed to be persuasive in England and vice versa. There are some cases that go even further and say it's actually binding. Um, but we don't have to go there today. To, to, uh, but, but that's, um, and that's how that will work. Um, if you're talking about uh, decisions on devolved issues, um, then, it, uh, 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 and this does bleed very firmly into the Internal Market Bill if that becomes law, we'll be in a world where um, a Scots court may well uh, have to construe EU law as being X, uh, but that's subject to the sovereignty of the Westminster Parliament to say, well, you might think that, but we're actually uh, uh, effectively legislating that away from you, so that even in Scotland, the law is why. But if that's not what the questioner meant, they, they, of course, they can be asked the question, please. Yeah, of course. Um, well, that, I think that leads on a, a little bit to this one. Uh, wasn't Brexit to, regret, to regain supremacy of Parliament? Well, that's a political question, which really is not, I mean, who cares what I think about that? Um, uh, the the uh, Brexit, um, uh, I mean, it, it's difficult to know where to start. Um, uh, legally speaking, uh, what um, Miller number one told us was that uh, Parliament never lost its supremacy. Uh, the reason the majority held what they did, which, which was to say that it had to be Parliament, not the government, that pressed the button in Article 50 was what was because they said EU law gave rise to domestic rights and remedies. And so the, the government couldn't trigger Article 50 and pull the UK out or at least trigger the process of pulling the UK out of the EU because you can't use a prerogative to um, undermine domestic, domestic rights. What was buried in there was the proposition that EU law, when people talk about the source of EU law, it, it actually means two different things. If you mean the legal material, absolutely, that was the two treaties and regulations and directives and judgments of the ECJ, that, that's true. If though what you mean uh, is what gives that legal material the force of law in the UK, that was section two of the 1972 Act, without which it didn't have the force of law. And the Supreme Court in the UK, that there were three cases, one's called FAM, one's called Assange, and one's called HS2, went out of its way well before Brexit to say that there were certain um, um, principles of UK law, parliamentary supremacy being one of them in HS2, that even if EU law required uh, in that case, parliamentary privilege to be overturned, the Supreme Court wouldn't do it. Okay. So what I've said in a long-winded way is that even whilst a member of um, uh, the EU, Parliament didn't lose its supremacy, not legally speaking. Uh, 
Any other questions? Yes. Um, so I don't know whether you would know <laughs> about this, but somebody has asked, will there be less work coming to the bar post-December generally? No, if you think about, um, well, actually, again, I'm not sure, this, this is not an undertaking <laughs> um, um, uh, or any sort of warranty. Um, if you think about the sort of issues which I've said are problems, one, what is retained EU law? Two, is a particular UK act or um, secondary legislation within section two, uh, because it was brought in for the purpose of uh, UK EU compliance or not? Uh, um, does supremacy apply? Uh, or what is sympathetic construction? I mean, that's making work. Um, if anything, the complaint here is that this the work of uh, UK lawyers needing to know about EU law, a, a, a second layer of uh, complexity, which is, and how does um, these issues that I'm talking about, how do they play into um, EU law? Uh, and having to grapple with um, how judges are going to be feeling their way into this new world. That's going to be more work. The only, the, the losers in this aren't the lawyers, I'm afraid. The losers in this are, is business, clients. Okay, so more work, if anything. Uh, I, I, I think so, actually, that's my prediction. Um, but it's not a good thing for business, it's a bad thing. Mm. Um, okay, we have another question. Um, what do you think should be the position regarding the rights of lower courts to overrule existing EU case law? I'm thinking here of the recent consultation on the ability of courts to depart from EU law after 31st of December. Could you envisage problems? That's what I thought I was talking about. The consultation led to regulations which are in draft now, uh, but it, uh, the consultation led to the Court of Appeal the inner house of the court of session, um, actually it also the high court of justiciary acting as a criminal court in Scotland, um, the lands tribunal and courts marshals being able to depart from uh, ECJ decisions. So that's, that's, the, that, that, that's exactly what I was just talking about. And I'm saying I absolutely can see problems with that because if I am trying to decide a case, um, let's say next January, on a very difficult point of retained EU law, and I think I've got the answer and write my judgment, uh, then between writing my judgment, the Court of Appeal says, well, I know you thought that we were applying you know, CGE, uh, CJEU decisions, but we're not now, we've decided to change. I would have to bring the parties back. So I can, I can envisage huge problems. Okay. Um, isn't it that the court have to actually line up their domestic law with EU law if ever any conflict occurs? Uh, hmm. um, I wonder if, the, I wonder if the, 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 the question can resubmit the question because I'm not sure, again, um, what they mean. They can mean a number of things. Do they mean sympathetic construction? Well, I've talked about that. Sympathetic construction, I think, has gone after 31st December. However, um, uh, uh, what I do think is that, uh, like all uh, construction of statutes uh, in, um, in this jurisdiction, uh, you have to bear in mind its legislative archaeology, that it was, one, it was in the past brought into secure EU compliance, and that might give you a clue as to what words mean. That's not sympathetic construction. That's a recognition of its legislative history. Um, so, if the questioner means, will we still continue to uh, um, acknowledge legislative history? Yes. Are we still under a duty to apply this strong notion of sympathetic instruction? No. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, what would the status of Rome 1, Rome 2 and Brussels recast regulations be? Um, they would all be uh, within um, uh, either se Section 3 direct EU legislation or they would have given rise to uh, recognising available EU rights under Section 4. So they will retain the EU law right subject to critically, critically, critically 
um, uh, primary or more, much more likely regulations which excise one or more parts of them. And like I say, some very, very important EU regulations like the, the VAT uh, uh, implementing regulation has been excised. So the answer is the default position is that if it's a regulation or a directive, it's going to be in section either three or section four as retained EU law. But then you've got to go and check whether a primary act or a regulation has excised those from retained EU law. Okay, um, we have a follow-up question regarding sympathetic construction. If the construction was previously sympathetic to the EU legal regime, does that then mean construction will now be sympathetic to the UK legal regime? That, I think, is um, uh, 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 what I was saying about the, 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 um, uh, the acknowledgement and recognition that when uh, we have to ask sympathetic to what? So before we left, or before um, uh, uh, 31st January 2020, when we left, and then before the implementation period ran, uh, runs out on the 31st of December, it's sympathetic to the two treaties, or a regulation or a directive. First of January, sympathetic to the 2018 Act. It's like a colony, and I'm not making a political point here. Uh, I'm not. Um, it's like a colony that said we were a colony. We're not yesterday. We're not today. Mm -hmm. But that same statute has to be now construed in this new light, in this new legislative world. Okay. Thank you. Um, got one more question. Uh, what would be the impact on what would the what would be the impact on the EU nationals living and doing business in the UK in terms of dual business transaction disputes? In in, in respect of um, what, what, what disputes? Dual business transaction disputes. Uh, I don't know what that is. Um, um, uh, I mean, uh, if I don't know, I'd mentally put quite a lot of money to lots of people don't know. Uh, but but, but, but um, the answer is, if you're talking about the withdrawal agreement, the withdrawal agreement gives specific rights to uh, EU nationals, so your Italians, Germans, French, whatever, uh, to a right to reside, a right um, to, to not be discriminated against. And that extends to both, as it were, um, personal, private, and business uh, uh, transactions. And that has been brought into UK law by Section 7, Capital A of the 2018 Act. But that's not what my talk was about. But those those specific rights, a right to stay here, a right not to be discriminated against, whether you're doing business or just living here, um, a right to access, therefore, uh, housing, um, and not to be discriminated against on grounds of your passport, that is here located in uh, the withdrawal agreement brought into UK law by Section 7A. Okay. And that would govern your business deal. Okay. Okay, thank you for going outside of your topic there. Um, does anybody have any other questions that they would like to ask? Uh, just to let those know, um, there are five chats, but I don't know what to do with those. Um, uh, yeah, there's so, one here has asked if there's any way that they could keep track of your upcoming lectures. Are you doing any, any future lectures that you, that you know of that they could also attend? Well, I teach in Cambridge, so if you're here, then um, you'll see me. But 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 um, uh, otherwise, um, uh, th this lecture, uh, as I say, will be um, is, is 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 going to be turned into a book, which I encourage you all to buy and all your friends to buy, and, and um, <laughs> everybody will be happy. Um, uh, I, I do other lectures and other things, uh, but but um, I, and I. Uh, I like doing things for the end. So, but 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 um, uh, somebody's asking, do I have a? Oh, it's come up now. A specific link, email, or page? No, I haven't got those. I don't, I, I, I don't, um, so um, uh, no. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, it'll be for the end to publicise anything I do. I think through the end. Yeah, absolutely. If anybody is interested, we'll be putting the video of this of tonight's talk up on the INS media page and then any further events that you do, I'm sure we will promote as well on our social media and on the website. Oh, it looks like we have one more question. 
uh, there is a comment saying discriminatory laws are already on their way. I'm not sure. I don't know what to do with that. I mean, no. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I mean, um, um, the, uh, what, uh, speaking as a lawyer, and it's very, very, very important that we inform all of the discussions as to the legal quality, the juristic quality of this, because um, uh, politically what's going to happen, that ship really has sailed. And anyway, that's not what these talks are about. Um, and my personal politics and nobody else's business. Um, um, the answer, the legal answer to discriminatory laws would be, you may have rights under the, under the withdrawal agreement brought into UK law under section 7A. The HRA is still here because the convention is different. That's got nothing to do with EU law. The Convention on Human Rights is nothing to do with EU law. It's a separate body of law. Okay. Um, so all I can say is bear that in mind. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Well, I think uh, unless anybody has any more, any more questions relevant to tonight's topic, we'll say thank you very much, Julian. That was brilliant. Um, thank you everyone for attending. I hope you have a lovely evening. You are now welcome to go and enjoy your dinner and a glass of wine maybe um, and yes we'll be putting the video up tomorrow afternoon on the on the website thank you very much i'm very grateful emma i wonder once everybody's left about